Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and several months ago a commenter on Reddit made a post asking for help in what he referred to as the Matt Mercer effect. Essentially his players were all huge Critical Role fans, and they were vocally disappointed whenever their Game Master handled things differently than Matt Mercer. Now Mercer himself did jump in, saying how stuff like this breaks his heart, because every group and every game is different and should be, and I'll post a link below if you want to read through that huge Reddit thread. What I'm going to talk about today is player expectations. With the popularity of all the recorded gaming shows out there, like Critical Role, tabletop gaming has ultimately benefited from this. Uh, they've introduced thousands of people to the world of tabletop gaming, and they've also introduced a lot of people to new ways of gaming that they might have not have considered before. However, there are a few negative aspects to it as well, and the Mercer Effect is of course one of them. And this is where players and game masters expect their games to play out exactly like it does on their favorite streaming shows, and then the frustrations and disappointments that that can lead to when it doesn't. Now I admit when I first read this post and I was reading through it, I thought to myself, well, this is nothing that I've had to deal with personally. You know, all of my players have been playing longer than Critical Role or any of these shows have been around, so this is really just a problem that the newer generation of gaming has to deal with. Uh, something that I can sympathize with, but nothing that I myself have ever had to experience. That was until I read this line. How do you guys deal with players who've had past DMs they swear by? And that is when it clicked. I knew exactly what this post was talking about. I've dealt with this before. But for me, it wasn't Matt Mercer. For me, it was Jeff. The greatest dungeon master alive. Okay, so let me tell you a story. 20 years ago, 1999, I transferred off to a new college, and to help paint you a picture of what this looked like, this is me. I know, right? There's a lot to unpack and make fun of there, but we just don't have enough time for it. But two fun facts. One, that table that I'm sitting at is the one that's right behind me at the moment. And two, this hook horror miniature is still unpainted. I keep promising I'll get to it sometime, but you know how it goes. Anyway, I'd assembled a group of players for some Dungeons & Dragons, and most of them were pretty experienced gamers. Now, one of them, though, was amazing. He is still today what I consider to probably be the best role player that I've ever seen. He was absolutely amazing. But because this story is about him, and I don't want to embarrass him over something that he did 20 years ago, you know, none of us were the same people that we were 20 years ago, so out of consideration of my old friend, I'm going to call him Todd. Sup? Now back home, Todd and another dungeon master they'd been playing with for some time, and his name was Jeff. And from everything that Todd told me about him, Jeff was... The greatest dungeon master alive. Now we played every single week, and sometimes, often, I would make a bad call or do something wrong as the Game Master. And whenever that happened, Todd would say, Yeah, Jeff never would have done that. And then he'd regale me with some amazing story about how Jeff would have done it way better than me. Sometimes, though, I believed that I ran a perfect game, a flawless game, or at least that's what I thought until I asked my players what they thought about it. That was an awesome game. Yeah, brother, that was a lot of fun. It was fine, I guess, but Jeff would have done it differently. Again, followed by some recounting how Jeff took a similar situation and handled it in ways far better than I could have even imagined. Needless to say, I was getting a bit of a complex, so I tried to improve myself. I listened to all of Todd's stories and I tried to get better as a dungeon master, but I was never ever good enough. Jeff was always better than me and Todd was always there to make sure that I knew that. I was beginning to think that Jeff was a little too good to be true, but one of my other players went back home with Todd one weekend and while he was there he got to play with Jeff. So my player got back, I asked him what it was like. Yeah, it was pretty good, man. Pretty good. Now, obviously my buddy was just trying to soften the blow now that he'd played with perfection, and I could just hope that maybe he would still enjoy playing with me now that he'd experienced what a real dungeon master was like. Anyway, this went on for some time, and I was pushing myself harder and harder, trying to get out from underneath Jeff's shadow. Now, the campaign eventually ended, and we started a new campaign, and it was the most ambitious and experimental campaign that I'd ever tried. This was really far outside my regular thing, but I knew that it was possible because Jeff had done games that were just as sandboxy and just as elaborate, and if he could do it, so could I. Unfortunately, Todd had already moved away at this point, but I was still pushing myself to be better. Now eventually, after a few years, Todd did move back. He met a girl, fell in love, got engaged, and his best man, of course, was Jeff. Now I was at Todd's bachelor party. We're at a bar, we're having fun, and that's when I look over and I saw him. Jeff. The greatest dungeon master alive. I walk up to him to introduce myself, and I'm going to tell him how much Todd has been ranting and raving about him for years. But before I can, Jeff says to me, Wait, you're Seth. Todd has told me all about you. 
From what I hear, you're the, the greatest dungeon master alive. Jeff starts telling me how Todd would rant and rave about what a great dungeon master that I was, and how he started getting a complex because he'd been living in my shadow for so long. I told him that no, he was the greatest DM alive, and that I too had a complex because Todd had raved about him for years about how great he was. Jeff seemed just as surprised about this as me, so we called Todd over, asking him why for all these years he'd given each of us these complexes, telling us how the other one was so much better than us, and Todd just shrugged and said, well, I was just trying to help you guys be better. And with that, he quickly found someone else to talk to. Now, Jeff and I figured out that Jeff was amazing at high roleplay and elaborate sandbox games. Meanwhile, I excelled at elaborate dungeons and traps and very thrilling, fast-paced combat. Both of us had made efforts to improve in those areas that we weren't just as strong in. So in truth, what Todd did worked. I'm a far better game master now than I was because of this, and I assume that Jeff is too. Now, for those of you watching, you might be thinking to yourself that Todd did something good. You know, offering constructive criticism to improve the game and to help us out. However, that's not the case at all. It didn't happen like that. One, I was there. And two, I know Todd. You see, Todd never offered it constructively. Neither Jeff or I heard what it was that we did well. We only heard about where we failed. And that is a terrible way to offer criticism. And the reason that Todd never told us where it was that we were doing good was because at the time that he voiced his opinion, Todd didn't see what it was that we were doing well. Todd's criticisms weren't suggestions on how to make a good thing better. They were complaints about why he wasn't having fun. They were full-on gripes. Whenever he was playing with one of us, he'd become fixated on whatever it was that he didn't have at that moment, and therefore couldn't appreciate what it was that he did have. A grass is always greener on the other side sort of mindset. Todd was making himself miserable, and as a result, was taking it out on us. So bringing this back to the Mercer effect, the situation with celebrity game masters really isn't that all different. But instead of having a few dozen former players that are going to say that they were the greatest dungeon master that's ever lived, these dang masters now have audiences that number in the thousands that hold them as the gold standard. So it's really just a bigger footprint that each of them have. But the second aspect that they have, and this is a little bit more difficult to describe, is that they're mythic. And what I mean by that is, let's say that you're dating somebody, and this person that you're seeing is always talking about their ex, and their ex was evidently the best in the world at everything, and whatever you can do, their ex can do better. That is frustrating. However, at least their ex-partner was somebody they knew, a human being, and human beings have limitations. Now let's say that you're dating somebody, but instead of them bringing up an ex that they're obsessed with, uh, they're now obsessed with some sort of Hollywood celebrity or some Instagram model out there. You're not held against the standard of Billy the ex-boyfriend or Susie the ex-girlfriend. No, you're held up against David Tennant or a Kardashian. And no matter how well you do something, you're held up against this romanticized concept of what perfect is supposed to be. You see, this person that you're dating probably has never met David Tennant or met a Kardashian, and they probably probably haven't played with Matt Mercer or any of the other celebrity game masters out there. They only see the good that is presented before them in some sort of public medium, and they assume that it's always good or it's always been that good. These celebrities aren't being held as human beings, they're being held as an ideal. That's not just unfair to you, the living, breathing person that's being compared to an ideal, but it's also unfair to themselves because they've now given themselves an unreasonable standard. No one is perfect, and the people out there who are amazing at something weren't always amazing at it. And while I've never met Matt Mercer or most of the other big-name streamers out there, many have said on record that the level they're at now is based off years and years of experience. And experience isn't always pretty. For example, there are several people who have played with me or under me for the past 28 years that can tell you very true, very real horror stories of terrible calls that I've made on my part and very bad games that I've run. And I'm willing to bet that all of the experienced game masters out there have players or former players who can also give you similar stories. It reminds me of a piece of graffiti wisdom I once read on a bathroom wall. Latrinalia is the term for it, and that right there is the first time I've gotten to use any of my anthropological schooling. But anyways, this bathroom graffiti said, no matter how hot she is, someone somewhere is sick of her crap. Only it didn't say crap. 
What that sage-like vandal was saying is that no matter how perfect you might think somebody is, there is somebody else out there who would disagree, and they probably have some stories to back that up. But a player who holds a celebrity game master as their standard and places them on a pedestal will never experience the ugly, that one day their perfect game master just wasn't on point or just made a bad ruling. They'll never experience those little interpersonal quirks that might be annoying from time to time. Therefore, no living, breathing game master is ever going to meet this ideal of what this person on a pedestal is always going to meet, which again means that nobody in the room is going to be happy, not the player and certainly not the game master. In my video for the RPG Social Contract, I bring up that before any game session, everyone should just assume that they're going to be having fun. Essentially, take the requirements off of the game that it must be this fun before they're allowed to have a good time, and they should just walk in being ready and open for anything. It makes us receptive to whatever is actually offered at the game. Now, part of being receptive includes holding your players and your game master as to what they are and not what or who they aren't. Offering criticism is fine. Ga players and game masters should always be trying to improve themselves. Once you stop trying to improve yourself, that's when you start degrading. But constructive criticism includes telling somebody what it is that they're doing well, encouraging them, and offering suggestions that are something more than just simply telling them that you wish they were somebody else. That's where Todd made his mistake and many other players out there, such as the original players that were talked about in that original Reddit post. They fell for the trap of wishing that their game master was somebody else and ignored everything else good that was presented for them. The Mercer effect isn't new. It's been around since the second person out there decided that they wanted to run a game. The biggest difference, though, is the visibility that these game masters have now, and it spreads out to a lot of people who now have no experience actually playing with these GMs that they idolize. The trick to solve it, like most other issues in tabletop gaming, is simply communication. Again, there is nothing wrong with offering some criticism or some suggestions. However, sometimes we need to be able to offer criticism on how other people are offering criticism. And that is the only way we can improve. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff like game reviews and how to's, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, amigos, stay awesome. You know, Jeff's video would have been a lot better.